I now have the privilege to introduce Dr. David Taylor, and I'm going to go off script here a little bit because I work just down the street from Dr. Taylor. And I think if most of us had a magic wand, we would want to go to a community with a high degree of need and wave that wand and get the medical community, the educators, the cultural institutions, and the government of that community to all cooperate together to nurture the children as best they possibly could and lead to great outcomes. In the town of Goldsboro, North Carolina, which is less than two hours from where I live, they have that magic wand, and his name is Dr. David Taylor. Uh, Dr. Taylor founded a solo pediatrics in, uh, practice in Goldsboro, in North Carolina in 1978. He is currently serving an appointment as adjunct professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the UNC School of Medicine. He is a past president of this body the American Academy of Pediatrics, and of course, of my chapter, the North Carolina chapter as well. He also has been a longtime member of the AAP Council on Communications and Media. Today, Dr. Taylor is going to talk about how media use and school performance interact and what pediatricians can do to help children do their very best at every age. So it is my honor to welcome yet another one of my heroes, Dr. David Taylor. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about a subject that was really not on my radar screen as a student, a resident, pediatrician for maybe 30 of my 40 years. And so it's been a lot of fun to slowly uh, get up to speed. I'm not anywhere near up to the speed of the previous two speakers. So we'll get down to uh, really practice issues. Is there a button? Oh, here it is. Good. The um, changes you'll see in your practice, I hope, uh, as Winston Churchill said when he was out in the country between his terms as prime minister, and they asked him why he went to the country, he said, I, I went to the country to think. And I think most of us come to meetings to think. You know, let's, let's get out of the office, get out of the hospital and, and think. So uh, how do you structure your well-child visits so that we reflect this body of evidence that's been so elegantly published uh, today around the, the topic of media and child development and language development? And then in my own humble opinion, uh, as other speakers have said, there's too much on our plates during well-child visits. There's no way we'll really raise the tide unless we develop collaborative partnerships throughout our communities to uh, get more organizations and committed people to promote our agenda. This whole issue got my attention three to four years ago when I read that 66 to 82 percent of fourth graders in the United States were not reading proficiently. That just kind of blew me away. So I had been on the school board back in the 80s for about nine years and knew the people at the schools. I went to the schools and I said, well, uh, how bad, how bad is Eastern North Carolina? Particularly how bad is, is my rural county Wayne County, about an hour east of Raleigh, right in the middle of the hurricane flood zone for people that need a geographic reference. And our people could tell us that about 52% of our kindergarten kids didn't have the language skills they need to start learning to read. And then they could show us that about the same percentage of our fourth graders were not reading at grade level. And we had been doing reach out and read for like 12 years in our practice and my psychologist who uh, got all this data together for me said, I really can't see much of an uptick during the last decade. So uh, the mantra was kind of thrown down to us at Goldsboro Pediatrics and to the community, I thought, that we have a birth to five problem and somebody's got to address it. 
So I began to read and look into the material that has been presented by the early childhood folks in a previous Pete's 21. And uh, lo and behold, it is all about your vocabulary at age two years, predicting school performance, and the number of words you hear your parents say, and some kids hear 10 times as many words as others. It is a poverty thing, but unfortunately, there are not too many organizations that rub shoulders with every family in the community like we pediatricians do. And so to me, this is a, this is a huge challenge for us, but something we just got to, we got to do. The reference is from Hart and Risley, and embarrassingly enough, it was mid-90s. So where was I when I was supposed to be learning all this stuff? Um, my observation in seeing patients is that I can't get the parents' attention in the exam room because they're on their phones. And the only way they think we can make it through the visit is to give every child in the room an iPad. And so I see this as an addiction uh, that we all, including me, are guilty of suffering with, and yet there's no question it's hurting our children. And as has been alluded, we know that when the television's on in the house, adult conversation drops off. What happens when you add all this other media to the television? Probably uh, nobody's talking to anybody. It was a wonderful timing in 2013, 2014 for us in our practice to say, wow, let's do something about this because the entire strategic plan of the American Academy of Pediatrics is all about this when you get down to poverty and epigenetics and early brain and child development and children, adolescents and media. So uh, it looked like a fun, a fun project to start working on. As you look at some reflections on well child care, because I thought, well, gee, I better start with my group. Uh, Ed Shore in 2004 wrote about how our preventive services really are not meeting the needs of the most vulnerable children in our practices. And if you look at the AAP's guidelines for periodicity schedule, which is our well child uh, schedule, uh, big word for well child schedule, it, it really addresses the needs of children who have no psychosocial problems. And so this kind of gives you a green light to adapt your well child checkup to the vulnerability of your population. The well child visit may be uh, mandated by an insurance company, Medicaid, some compliance officer, developmental screening, immunizations, a, a, a large mix goes into determining what is a well child visit. And then these are all the things that we're required to do, or I think we're required to do, where you can go through parent concerns, uh, family structure, ACE, adverse childhood experience screening, maternal depression, past medical history, nutrition, sleep, media use, uh, if they're smokers, we need to get down to what do we do about them. Oral health has become a larger part of what we do. Uh, developmental assessments, immunizations, going over the SIDS guidelines with the infants, parents. And then safety, uh, language and development somewhere in there, discipline issues, and do a complete unclothed physical assessment all in, what, 18 minutes. So uh, we have to decide as professionals what's really important. And so personally, I have begun to rely more and more on some written materials and uh, the quick and dirty for a lot of this. And I zero right in on all this early brain child development and media because I think the media and the early brain are just inseparable. Uh, we do get some support, although I understand from Dr. Christakis that some of this is being modified as I speak, and I did uh, have the chance to read these new publications, which are marvelous. But we have guidelines for the Academy that tell us uh, that the screens may not be so good for our children, particularly as it relates to early brain and language development. 
The practice implications are that, as I've said before, we uh, have the captive audience. Uh, only about a third of the high-risk children in North Carolina have access to early Head Start or Head Start or quality daycare or pre-K, and much of that is too little too late because as the brain development slides were shown in the last presentation, if you don't get this done in the first two to three years of life, you've missed a tremendous opportunity and you probably can't, can't recoup. Um, so we must move forward with this one way or another. Uh, there are guidelines also for the home environment that come from the academy and in Bright Futures, uh, which are supportive. It's, it's not a matter of us not having the information we need. It's a matter of us maybe not finding the time or the way to get this done. And then the real challenge for me is, since I've talked to my school people, can I measure this going forward to show that what I'm doing makes a difference? There are activities we encourage. It's been said, and I think we should continue to do all of this, that reading is so important, particularly at bedtime, and reinforcing early that we don't want TV and media, phones in the bedroom, because we know our teenagers are behind closed doors with cable TV and the internet, which is a terrible conversation. Most people understand that. And so getting a, a leg up by a bedtime routine, I think is very important and then reinforcing that anything you do down on the floor with drawing, coloring, blocks, rings, chalkboards, uh, you name it, 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 slowly but surely I've been able to convince parents that the television is more of a talking head, one-way street. And if you think about what makes you think as an adult, it's when somebody asks you a question. And the TV and the, and the media toys really don't effectively ask questions, although, as has been alluded, the, the iPad probably has some potential to stimulate thought better than some of the other forms of media. But by and large, I encourage my parents early on, whenever their children make a noise that sounds like it might be a word one of these days, let's come back with a question, with a sentence, with an answer. And as they get old enough to watch educational TV, let's, let's make this interactive. So I think there's some, there's some good messages for us. We have plenty of material, uh, but I just uh, don't think we've got the time. I think we have to get a lot of help with the uh, community. And so we have spent educational sessions after educational sessions getting our providers to, to get into this. And we've also now begun to branch out into the community, and we've also partnered with the schools. Our practice is 16 pediatricians and nine nurse practitioners, physician assistants, uh, four offices. We're the only pediatric practice in the county, so every child who enters the kindergarten in our public school district is our patient. So we do have an opportunity to actually do something and measure this. And our school friends are measuring kindergarten readiness three times a year and looking carefully at elementary school reading. Plus, we're a very poor community. Uh, and so that is another uh, good thing for us as far as being able to demonstrate to other people that something works because that's really where the, the problem is. It's, it's, it's a poverty issue. Uh, also within the office visit and within the community, we promote good nutrition, protein and fat being good for the brain, and weave that in with what else is good for the brain. And so the face-to-face -face talking is what is so good for the brain, the serve and return that comes from the communication between parent and child. And the, uh, I, I just encourage parents to put the media in the proper perspective. Basically, if your child doesn't develop good language and reading abilities, what are they going to do with all this technology? And so it's a first things first. I said, if I could just put this technology and TV in the deep freeze until they're reading at a third grade level, 
uh, I'd be okay. And, and, and parents, parents seem to resonate with that. Uh, so our birthday year's goal is to have a child who's talking well and reading well in the third grade. Reach Out and Read is the foundation for our program. As I said before, we've been using this for 12 years. We've expanded it to the six-year-old child. We're doing some chapter book things with elementary school. And I've been on some of these conference calls with Perry Class and others to talk about how do you move it down to birth, because thank goodness now the Academy has said we really should start at birth reading to children uh, one way or another. And the reach out and read and giving the book really is the uh, key to the office visit, I think. You just got to do that first. You got to get that done. And you got to realize that might be the most important thing you're doing for the future of uh, your community and the, and the country. So our reach out and read routine or our well child visit routine is to give the book, see what the child does with the book, talk with the child, talk with the mother, get some of that interactions going, and then explain to the mother that all this is so much important than most media use and reinforce to the parent that, you know, you're gonna have teachers down the road in school and preschool and so forth, but you, you the parent, you are the first teacher, you're undoubtedly the most important teacher. As James Heckman, the economist who was our keynote when Jay Berkelhammer was your president, the greatest uh, capital that you can invest in is human capital, and of that, the most important component is the mother. And I think we have to really believe that and, and build this issue into that fact. Now, with our community-based coalition, we were blessed by the uh, hospital being able to uh, make a video for us and I don't know if this will work or not. I was gonna show it to you. But I've gotta get that pointer on that video. I don't think it's gonna work. I was hoping to show the video, Dave, but I mean, it worked fine when I was before. Oh, there it is. Now we'll see if we get any sound or not. Dimitri, I told with the sound. Is there something else I need to do? Does anybody know? I'm Dave Taylor. I'm a pediatrician at Goldsboro Pediatrics, and I've been working in Goldsboro as a pediatrician since 1977. Goldsboro Pediatrics has become very concerned recently about statistics showing that between one-third and two-thirds of fourth graders in North Carolina are not reading proficiently. That is, they're not reading as well as they should be at their age and their grade level according to their teachers. Goldsboro Pediatrics met with Wayne County Public School authorities in November to talk about these issues. The children who enter kindergarten who are not ready to read really are not reading proficiently in the fourth grade. So the schools basically told Goldsboro Pediatrics that we, the pediatricians, the community, need to do more to be sure more children are ready to read when they get to kindergarten. The more you expose them to words and vocabulary as they are younger, the more their brain absorbs, the more they'll learn. They will be ready for reading even before they understand what reading is. It's important to speak to them, to read to them, to show them your love for reading, the love for words, and then as they grow, they will be able to express themselves and use vocabulary uh, as they get older and interact in daily life. There is a lot of research that's being done and has been done on the early language and brain development of young children. And this research shows that the number of words the babies hear their mothers and fathers say in the first two years of life is what determines how well they are talking and handling language and ready to read when they get to kindergarten. Some babies hear 10 times as many words as other babies. So our challenge as pediatricians, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, friends of families who have children is to try to talk to these children face to face as much as possible. The baby's favorite two things are the mother's face and the mother's voice. So we need to hold these babies right out in front of us as if we were reading a book and let the baby try to make eye contact with us 
and talk with them face to face as much as possible. A lot of us are so consumed by our smartphones and iPads and we have the television running all the time. And all this technology is pulling us away from our children. There is a body of research showing that when the television is on, adults stop talking. So I think my wife had it right back in the 70s when our television stayed off and the only time it was on was if there was something that we were going to watch with the children. So we were talking with the children about what was on the television. I think interactive use of technology and media is just fine. But what we have to do with our babies is when they are awake, we need to turn off the television to remind ourselves that what our babies really need is to have normal brain development, normal language development, and to be good readers by the fourth grade, to be ready to read when they go to kindergarten. They need their parents to be talking to them as much as possible in those critical first two years of life. The uh, hospital paid about $5,000 to develop that. I was just amazed, and they did it without batting an eye. And so we started there with our coalition so that we show that video on the postpartum ward. We show that video in the prenatal clinic at the health department, and then it runs on the closed circuit TV or educational TV in uh, all four of our offices. And anyone who comes up to us and wants a copy of that, we get it from the hospital. The public library took over the lead for this and found grant money through a National Library Association fund that comes to the state. And our Smart Start agency in the state of North Carolina, which is a quality daycare uh, operation in every county, and then from our United Way. And so now we have an administrator who used to be an administrator in the public schools who retired. So she knows everybody in the county. And then a 20-year uh, veteran of preschool teaching who grew up in the community, and then a bilingual assistant to the preschool teacher. And these people will go out into the projects, the housing projects, the churches, the civic groups to spread the agenda uh, of the project. The Goldsboro Housing Authority is giving us access to its nine uh, locations so that we can go there and provide services on site. We have what's called a, uh, the group is called Reed Wayne, uh, and I've just talked about uh, that group, but that's the way they decided to name the new group. They have a van, they call it a Wee Wings van, and it's a big school bus it looks like this remodeled as a classroom so they drive this classroom out into the neighborhoods and invite the children and the parents to come onto the classroom where they provide a significant amount of education and enrichment for uh, at-risk children and their parents the uh, other aspects of the community-based coalition are the head start program we have a very good large head start program we've just put in a grant for an additional 300 early Head Start slots. Uh, and they are doing some uh, research themselves on children who start Head Start in the summer and retesting in the spring to see how much progress they're making. Our Smart Start is our daycare quality enhancement agency. They've been very supportive with community forums and they go into uh, different daycares and promote the agenda of the project. And then the public schools, as I said, are measuring how we're doing with school readiness and they are also providing forums in the community. Our local colleges are promoting this agenda in their early childhood education programs that train the workers who are going to be in the daycare centers. Our churches are adopting schools where there are a large number of high-risk children to provide whatever it takes. Maybe it's food insecurity, uh, literacy, uh, books, gently used books to distribute to these kids. 
uh, and also the churches are providing a forum for us to promote the agenda of the project. And then there's a local foundation which is offering financial assistance to the library because we definitely want to sustain this effort. To me, though, it's uh, the most fun thing I've ever done in practice. Uh, and, and this is from somebody who started back in the late 70s when we were keeping kids alive with H. flu B meningitis and taking care of sick preemies and, and, and a lot of the, the really exciting hands-on care that, that was what we did in those days. We still do a little today, but with the vaccines and the neonatologists, most of us in this room are not intensivists and neonatologists. This is fun stuff, the fact that you can start with these horrible statistics, and we're hopeful that we may be able to move the needle. And I hope that today, uh, during this Peach 21, you'll reflect on this and, uh, and jump in with both feet and uh, see what we can do. Thanks for inviting me to speak with you.